Chapter 17 of The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter. Fighting the Flames. Out of the tent crawled Tad, utterly regardless of the fact that he was not altogether warmly clad for a cold night. And what met his eyes when he reached the open was enough to excite him still further. The wind was blowing pretty stiffly, and the fire had already jumped into the brush surrounding the camp. If given its head for even a short time, it seemed bound to get started in the dead pine needles, and once it spread there, all the desperate efforts of a dozen firefighters would be wasted. Several figures could be seen, bounding here and there, and slashing at the red flames with anything they could get hold of that would answer to bring about a halt in their spread. Of course, these must be the late guardians of the sleeping camp who were now shouting so strenuously and begging the rest of the campers to come to their aid, Step Hen and Davy Jones. Besides, there were the guides hard at work, having been aroused with the first cries, for they still persisted in sleeping under a rude shelter they had made out of branches and weeds. Tad rushed into the fray and began to do his very utmost to keep the dreaded fire in check. He saw that the others were also crawling forth, Bumpus, Giraffe, and Allen, all occupants of the first tent, and realizing the importance of concerted action, they lost not a second in getting busy. Bumpus, in particular, was a sight to behold, and had he been less busy, Tad felt that he must have doubled up with laughter to see him. He persisted in donning a most stunning red check suit of pajamas, for being so stout he did not suffer from the cold as much as some of the others. And as his simple heart was wrapped up in the business that just then engaged his full attention, Bumpus was prancing around, looking more like a clown from the circus than anything Tad could think of. But all the same, the fat boy fought tooth and nail at the spreading fire. He had on his shoes, as had the others, so that he could jump on the creeping flames when all else failed. And using an extra piece of canvas that sometimes had done duty as a tent floor, Bumpus sailed into the fray like a hurricane. Indeed, they were all as busy as beavers for a short time. Every scout seemed to feel that it would be a lasting disgrace on the name of the Silver Fox Patrol if that fire got away into the woods. They had assumed the responsibilities of assistant fire wardens, and it would be a sorry joke indeed if, instead of putting out a conflagration, they themselves were the cause of one that swept the whole adjacent territory. Give it thunder! shouted Giraffe, as he threshed wildly at every head of fire he could see near his boundary of action. Hit him again, boys! shrilled Bumpus, as he continued to do his great act of working with both hands and feet at the same time, all serving to quench the threatening flames. But Step Hen and Davy were strangely silent, though they worked as hard as anyone. They knew that they were to blame for all the trouble, for they had slept on their post, and with this sad result. Finally, success came to the hard-working scouts and their allies, the two guides. The fire was completely routed, bag and baggage, before it managed to get a good foothold in the dry woods. And perspiring as though it were the good old summertime, the boys hastened to get more clothes on them for fear of catching cold. The fire was resurrected, and they sat down to have a powwow. Oh, you needn't all look at us that way, grunted Step Hen. We're guilty, all right. Knock us all if you want to, because I just guess now we deserve it. But we never meant to go to sleep there by the fire, did we, Davy? Well, I should say not, replied the other culprit, looking quite dejected. We kept a telling each other that we mustn't sleep right along, and then to think that after all we did drop off, and both together. First thing I remember, said Step Hen, as if resolved after pleading guilty to open up and throw himself on the mercy of the court, I heard a queer crackling noise, and opened in my eyes, my stars, the whole world seemed like it was a fire. I gave Davy a punch in the side, and then jumped for it. We thought at first we could get her under control. Then I saw it was a no-go, for the old fire kept extending all the while. So I started to wake you all, and Davy, he joined in. After that, Eli and Jim joined us, and then the rest of you came. And believe me, fellers, Davy and me'll never forget it. 
you did handsome by us and we've been saved from disgrace that would have sent us into an early grave eh davy just so granted the other who was licking several burns he had received on his bare hands during the fierce little engagement just ended though he made no complaint seeming to think he had gotten off pretty easily considering the serious offense of which he had been guilty that of sleeping on his post and which might have cost him his life in war times had he been a soldier tad noticed this fact and quietly getting out some salve he carried for just such occasions forced davy to let him attend to his hurts though the other insisted that they did not amount to much anyway how do you think it got started giraffe asked and in so doing he really voiced the thoughts of everybody huh i reckon that's an easy one to answer replied step hen promptly anybody can see at just a single look that the wind must have picked up a live coal from the fire and carried it into a bunch of stuff to leeward after that it was fanned till it spread wider and wider that was going on while davy and me snoozed away like a pair of sillies no use talking boys i'm ashamed of myself and let me tell you it'll be a long time before i ever go to sleep on duty again not if i have to keep jabbing a pin into my leg every minute or so to make me jump does that explanation go tad asked bumpus still breathing hard after his recent violent exertions well it looks that way for the fire was actually to leeward of the camp when i first saw it answered the patrol leader but there must have been something in his manner rather than his speech that caught the attention of giraffe but you ain't quite satisfied are you tad he remarked pointedly you just keep a thinking that perhaps it wasn't an accident after all am i right now wow what does that kind of talk stand for burst out bumpus are you hinting that it was all a part of a dark scheme to burn us out of camp wait till eli and jim come back tad went on you've noticed that they're not with us right now fact is they took the lantern and went off about the time we were finishing our dressing but before they went jim gave me to understand what they had some reason to suspect the work of big kale martin and his crowd is that what you're aiming to tell us tad demanded giraffe here they come was all tad said oh my i thought you meant the game poachers exclaimed bumpus who had made a half movement in the direction of his gun standing conveniently near the two guides joined the circle around the fire eli held his hands out to the blaze as though they felt cold in that nipping night air jim simply caught the inquiring eye of the scoutmaster and immediately nodded his head in the affirmative and tad knew from that they had surely made some sort of important discovery what is it jim he asked they've been around here we found their tracks lots of places came the reply do you mean kale and si and ed asked the other only si and ed answered jim kale he warn't there at all we'd sized up his big tracks if he'd been they was two men in that canoe last night you seen while well, them must have been there a lot as fired the brush i guess as how kale he must have gone back to his shack by now but what on earth could they expect to get by burning us out demanded bumpus fust place they never expected to burn their camp observed jim if they had don't you believe they'd have gone to windward to start that blaze well they had a game with two of that up their sleeve tell us what it was jim urged tad though he himself had already jumped to a conclusion in the matter i guess as how they'd sort we'd have to make off a long distance away from camp to fight the fire and then they'd have plenty of time to clean her out but you see we didn't get fur away tall so they had all their work for nothing but them tracks was as plain as anything wa'n't they eli jim went on they be was a conclusive testimony of the older guide and every one of the scouts understood that eli had set the seal of his approval on all that jim had said it was certainly very unpleasant to realize that they were objects of desire on the part of even a pair of unscrupulous scamps granting that big kale martin had retired from the combination the boys seemed to get more indignant the longer they discussed the situation there was bumpus usually so mild and peaceful fairly palpitating with the desire to draw a bead upon those two unprincipled rascals we don't stand for much nonsense from outsiders do we fellers he appealed to the other five once before on this trip some bad men thought to get fresh with the silver fox patrol 
You all know what happened to Charlie Barnes, the leader of that bunch of yeggs that broke into the bank. Didn't we make the capture, though, and astonish Sheriff Green? And ain't we going to get ever so much money for recovering the stolen stuff? Well, that's what's going to happen to those husky chaps if they get too gay with us. They better go slow. If they can read, they'll see we're marked dangerous. Handle with care. Yes, said Giraffe. We'll just have to get busy and hand these sillies over to the head game warden. They're trying to interfere with our having the time of our lives up here in Maine, and we don't stand for anything like that. None of them felt like getting back to their blankets in a hurry after all that scare. So they just sat there around the fire, some of them with the blankets thrown over their shoulders, and compared notes all along the line. For what the guides had just told concerning the scheme of the unprincipled poachers filled the scouts with both indignation and anger. And more than one of them resolved that when his time came to watch, he would make sure to keep a loaded gun close to his hand, to be used to give the prowlers the fright of their lives. End of chapter 17 Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson